Yeah, so my name is Romani. Most of you know me, but for those of you who don't, um, I'm a member of the International Socialists who I joined when I was at Victoria University studying English and theatre. Um, I've also studied teaching and I've worked as a secondary school teacher around Wellington and I'm currently studying at Massey doing art and design. Um, so I have thoughts about education. Um, all right, so yeah, um, as promised, I'm going to be talking about the current attacks that are happening on universities, how we got here and the fight back against them. Um, hence the talk potentially running a little bit long. And even though it's going to run a little bit long, I still haven't had room to fit everything that I would want to talk about into this talk, but hopefully we can bring all of that into the discussion as well. Um, so the current situation, I'm sure a lot of you are already pretty aware of this, um, but we're seeing attacks across multiple universities in terms of job and course cuts primarily. So here at Victoria, um, the VC announced a few months ago that they wanted to cut the equivalent of um, 229 full-time jobs, um, including academic and non-academic staff. Entire subjects are threatened in these cuts, including secondary teaching, theatre, um, multiple languages, um, and other subjects like design technology, geophysics were on the list as well of, to be reviewed. Um, and before it came here, it was happening at Otago University. Um, so in April, the university announced that they wanted to cut 60 million, they wanted to save 60 million in their budget. And they were and are remaining vague about the details, but they're proposing cutting several hundred jobs um, and they've been putting pressure on staff to consider voluntary redundancies. Um, Massey University looks set to be next. So here too, management is being very vague, um, but it's known that there is a deficit of about 90 million. Um, they've begun talk about voluntary redundancies with staff, and they've been consulting on a policy for dealing with courses with low enrollment, which looks as if it could result in many courses being cut back and many being eliminated completely. Um, and the cuts this year are only the latest in a series of assaults over the last few years. Um, so... In the year 2020 to 2021 alone, factoring in voluntary redundancies, there were 300 jobs gone at Auckland, um, 71 at AUT, 40, uh, 74 at Massey, 100 at Victoria, more than 100 at Canterbury and Lincoln combined. Um, and this isn't factoring in things like fixed term positions not being renewed and other more sneaky ways that things are being cut back. Um, and the ramifications of courses and teaching being moved online and moving into blended models is also significant. And this isn't an issue I've been able to go into much detail about in my talk. So hopefully people can pick up on that in the discussion as well. All right. So how did we get here? Um, so to begin with, um, five out of eight universities are in severe financial hardship. So I'm just gonna, yeah, there we go. So we can actually see the slideshow properly. Cool. Um, and what has led to this? So we all know the external factors that have been cited repeatedly in the media. So inflation, COVID-19 and its merit effects, especially the closing of the borders. Um, the many factors that are drawing students away from study. So stress, the strong job market, the cost of living, falling rates of university, achievement, and all of these things are kind of connected to each other as well. Um, RNZ recently reported that nationally enrollments are down 5.1%. Um, international fee-paying students are down 13.7% and domestic students are down 4.1%. Victoria University reported a drop of 12% overall in 2023. So given that 28% of university funding comes from student fees and a large proportion of the 42% of funding that comes from the government depends on student enrollments, um, it's not hard to see that falling enrollments means less money 
the bums on seats model of university funding is an issue and we will return to this. Um, but the common sense that falling enrollments is what has led universities into these dire straits um, bears some examination. So low enrollments is the explanation that um, vice chancellors have been using to justify these cuts. It's the line pursued by Helen Nicholson, who's the acting VC at Otago. They always have acting VCs. They don't seem to have a real VC ever, which is puzzling. Um, and the latest round of proposed cuts at Otago. So um, the number of full-time students enrolled at Otago for 2023 is down 0.99% compared with 2022. Um, so senior leadership have been talking about the fact that um, total enrollments have been down by 5% relative to their optimistic 2022 forecast for a 4% rise during 2023. Um, but this is actually, when you look at it, a quite a small decline in enrollments for Otago, and the decline in domestic students is being offset by a rise in international students. Um, so this sort of perfect storm of factors leading to low enrollments is also the line that the government is really focusing on as well. So when asked about university funding, um, Carmel Cipollone, who was the acting PM at the time, while Trippi was in China, was saying um, there are other challenges. Inflation is a challenge. When you have high rates of employment in the market, the labor market is going gangbusters. It's a weird choice of words. Um, then people often make the decision to go into the workforce instead of taking up tertiary study options. Also, the cost of living pressures, that's sometimes a reason that uh, students take up the opportunity to work rather than study. There's a range of challenges, and I don't accept that the government is responsible for all of those challenges. Um, so it's no wonder that the government is on the defensive here as underneath the fluctuations in enrollments is the serious issue of the cumulative underfunding of the tertiary um, education in New Zealand. So successive governments have underfunded universities. The Tertiary Education Union estimates that the cumulative underfunding of universities by the key English government amounted to about uh, 3.7 billion from 2009 to 2018. Not only this, but they hiked domestic fees, reduced spending on student allowances, and increased the student loan repayment rate, so shifting more of this cost onto students. The Labour government has been somehow even worse. So allowing for inflation, Labour has driven through the deepest annual cuts to funding of New Zealand universities since 1984. Um, as Chris Whelan, um, the chief executive of Universities New Zealand points out, the government controls or provides 77% of university funding. In 2023 alone, that funding increased by only 1.6% at a time when inflation is running at more like 6.8%. So enrollments per se is not the issue here, although a dip in international enrollments that happened over COVID did exacerbate the situation. And that's because prior to 2022, universities had been using international fees, paying students, the fees of these students, um, to compensate for underfunding. So our international students pay some of the highest fees in the OECD, amounting to just over 513 million at last count. And this is why, um, incidentally, the vice chancellors were some of the most vocal opponents of the COVID elimination scheme that saw the borders being closed. Um, so this revenue stream was interrupted during COVID and the government didn't give enough um, support to offset that. But basically all of these contingent factors of recent years have just exacerbated the situation that's caused by the chronic underfunding. Um, so in all of the fuss about extra funding that the government has recently announced for universities, more on that later, obviously, it has been pointed out that the government has actually reappropriated significant funds from universities just in the last couple of years. Um, so just to go into some like number stuff, bear with me here. The 2022 budget set aside 4.939 billion for tertiary education, 
They only spent $4.486 billion, a savings of $453 million, because that money is allocated to full-time enrollments and those were down. So in the same budget, the government set aside at uh, $5.328 billion for spending in 2023. Now that we're in 2023, the new budget revised that number, dropping it by 355 million. So to sum up, they underspent by 553 million in 2022 and have since cut 355 million from the budget this year. So this is enough money to bail out Otago, Vic, Canterbury and Massey three times. So just keep that in mind as well throughout the these discussions. Um, so this is not to let the leadership of the universities off the hook. So looking at what they are doing with the money that they do have, um, staff and students have notes. Uh, it's widely rumored that the senior management at Otago has spent somewhere between 30 to 40 million on management consultants since 2015. Um, and here at Victoria, we've had a few um, issues with um, uh, strange priorities with the spending. Um, the expensive rebrand of 2017 to 2019 the massive building projects, marketing and competition with other universities, including buying real estate in Auckland near Queen Street. Um, I shouldn't say strange priorities, just different priorities from what we have for tertiary education. And then uh, faced with the repercussions of chronic underfunding, what have most of the universities done? Um, So the Tertiary Education Union has been trying for years to get VCs around the table to push the government to get more funding. Um, But rather than trying to tackle this issue of funding at the roots, um, they have chosen to take the axe to jobs and programs in an approach which is both unjust and hopelessly short-sighted. But as long as, you know, as long as they're keeping their cushy jobs, you know. Um, who cares? All right. So actually, though, how did we get here? Um, So this brings us to the crux of the issue, really, which is that New Zealand is running its universities as businesses, not as a public service, despite the fact that they are still publicly funded institutions. Um, In large part, this comes from the neoliberal structures, uh, restructures of the 80s and 90s. Um, So tertiary education was virtually free from 1940 up until 1990. Um, In 1990, the final year of the infamous fourth Labour government, university fees were introduced, and they had been trying to impose this since 1984, um, but had faced significant pushback from students. The average student fee in 1989 was $125, Ten years later, it had risen to 3,222. Meanwhile, government spending on uh, tertiary education plunged, with the funding per student between 1985 and 1989, um, the funding fell by a quarter. So very rapidly, the cost of tertiary education was shifted from the government to students. Um, Successive governments, both national and Labour, continued this more market reform work throughout the 90s. This was the period where universities introduced um, uh, full fees for international students, um, and there were successive cuts to student allowances and hikes of fees as well. Enrollments fell during this period, um, particularly among students from less well-off backgrounds from working-class families. Um, Māori enrolments in universities had been increasing throughout the 80s, but between 1994 and 1997, they fell by 28%. The management of universities changed in this period, um, with vice chancellors given sweeping new powers over budget um, as the chief executives of these institutions. Um, And management actually loved this. Um, So in 1996, um, there was a review, um, uh, Victoria University Management reviewed itself, reviewed the running of the university, and their recommendation was for um, an increased or wholly for-profit orientation for the university, um, even calling for the Crown to privatise it. 
Um, so in the, the same time, so during this period where student fees are increasing and government spending on tertiary education is dropping, vice chancellor salaries more than doubled. So under the current system, um, students are customers who go into massive debt to pay for their education. So government funding is also tagged to bums on seats. There's also performance-based research funding, which ties um, some of the funding to staff output. So staff are constantly under pressure to be publishing and uh, applying for funding. Um, universities also get money by providing research and development for private companies. Um, and portions of the university funding of the government actually goes towards this. So public money is here being used to sort of subsidize private companies. Um, universities are required to operate on a surplus of at least 3%. So alongside government funding, fees, research, universities are expected to make up their surpluses from commercialization, um, trading, and other revenue. So running universities um, like businesses means that universities are vulnerable to the vagaries of the market. So marketization is always trumpeted as a way to increase efficiency, um, but I ask people to look at the current state of tertiary education in New Zealand um, and say whether this is an efficient mm -hmm. system. So maintaining the neoliberal ideology and turning over short-term profits um, is being prioritized over the expense of long-term sustainability, and we shouldn't be surprised that that's the approach that's being taken. Um, the pressure to turn a profit exercises all kinds of pressures internally. So one of the most obvious ones is that universities cherry pick the subjects that they teach based on the ones that are profitable. We're seeing some of the ramifications of that at the moment with the cuts. Performance-based research funding means that staff are under pressure to be constantly publishing and applying for funding, meaning that time is taken away from teaching and public engagement and other things that they could be doing. Um, and externally, universities are competing with each other. And the national plans... Um, the National Party's plan to introduce another medical, uh, medical school, incidentally, would only exacerbate this. Um, and the result of operating universities like businesses um, is that, like any business, the university is enriching the few at the expense of the many. So not only are students being fleeced, um, but the labour of staff is being exploited. So traditionally, Academia has been seen as a cushy job, and certainly there are some higher rungs um, of tertiary education that are earning very large amounts and have good job security and all of that, but the reality for many is very different. Um, casualization and work insecurity is rife. Long hours, unpaid work, burnout is all prevalent. Um, and there are people working at the universities who earn very little. Um, so cleaners and security workers, for example, um, who are sometimes contracted out in order to cut costs and pay these pitiful wages. Tutors are routinely paid less than the living wage. Um, and meanwhile, as we've mentioned, um, management is taking home huge salaries. Um, so vice chancellors earn salaries higher than that of the prime minister, um, more than 700,000 per year at the University of Auckland, more than half a million at Victoria and Otago. So that is how we got here. Um, but actually, like actually though, how did we get here? <laughs> so bear with me. Um, the problem is capitalism. So universities predate capitalism, but they are profoundly shaped by it. So during the Industrial Revolution, universities expanded and started cropping up in the big cities. They were teaching different kinds of subjects, more practically oriented subjects to serve the interests of industry. Um, and then they've expanded further over um, the over the centuries, turning it into the modern tertiary system. Um, so in New Zealand, we saw universities expanding massively after World War II with um, increasing enrollments, the range of people who attended, the range of subjects expanding. And the modern university um, is playing a key role in training up white collar workers, administrators, professionals for business, um, government bureaucrats, as well as, as we've mentioned, providing research and technological development for business and maintaining and disseminating the ideology of the ruling class.
So as part of the capitalist system, universities are susceptible to the same problems and contradictions that plague the whole system, um, including periodic economic crises. There's, so these neoliberal reforms um, of the 90s were coming um, out of a... Uh, um, from a time when the economy was sort of sliding into recession as an attempt to restore profits, to shift costs onto um, students, staff, and the whole working class. Um, obviously, we're seeing, in, a, in broader terms, we're seeing economic crisis here now as well, with inflation just being one of the most latest um, manifestations of that. And... Again, we're seeing the general approach that's being taken by the government, by the ruling class, is to shift um, the cost of this onto all of us. Um, it's really jarring to read some of our writing from the early 2000s on the fight for, edu for tertiary education, saying things like um, the cost of restoring the uh, free education and universal allowances would be just 1.3 billion but Labour refuses to reverse Nationals' tax cuts and fund real moves towards this goal. Like, it's it's amazing that how familiar that sounds. Um, and the tax cuts they're talking about, by the way, came to um, uh, $3 billion that National handed back to the rich between 1996 and 1999 alone. Um, yes, very familiar. Um, and so even when we're not being messed around by the management, the specific management of our universities, tertiary education is still going to be shaped by the ideology and the crises of capitalism. And the specific shape of this will vary depending on the agenda of the ruling class at the time. So during the key years, for example, they cut funding for universities overall, um, but relative to this, they boosted funding for STEM while freezing funding for humanities. And attacks on arts and humanities are a recurring theme here. Um, although it's worth noting as well that the um, the capitalist case for humanities also makes my skin crawl. Um, so, you know, like technical and specialist skills are very important, but your soft skills really make you exploitable in a, in a very wide range of contexts. It creeps me out. Um, yeah, so the current crisis is just one manifestation of a struggle um, against the commodification of education and of all the parts of our lives without an end or um, which ends only with capitalism itself. Um, yeah, so I'll just address here the fact that um, university education sucks. Um, it feels, uh, yeah, it feels important to acknowledge this. Um, so we're stressed, broke, overworked, lonely, alienated, cold from living in shoddy flats um, and student accommodation. And as the cost of living and the cost of studying climbs, many are taking on jobs on top of study. Um, many are having to juggle childcare and other family responsibilities as well on top of this. So the grind of constant work and assessments takes away a lot of the joy of learning. Um, the nature of our assessments, which often feels very arbitrary, this focus on deadlines and presentation, has more to do with prepping us for being obedient workers than real learning is how it feels a lot of the time. Um, there's a culture of competitiveness and anxiety around grades, limited entry courses, things like that. And while there are always those who are fighting to broaden university culture, it's often an un uphill fight against narrow-mindedness, elitism, overt and covert racism and sexism. And of course, students from working class families, Maori and Pacifica students, um, students from other minority groups have an even harder time fighting back against the alienation on campuses. So, is it any wonder that enrollments are falling at universities? Um, by 2019, so this is before COVID even hit, um, there were 100 and, uh, what, 124,556 uh, fewer students studying at tertiary level. So these were dropping even before we had um, COVID, and obviously COVID has exacerbated this. Um, and yet for all of that, Capitalism can't fully take the joy and the liberatory potential out of the things that happen in university. 
I believe. Um, so they're contradictory. So in order to, in order for innovation to happen, they have to allow room for truth seeking and creativity and learning and questioning, even though those are the very things that kind of undermine the system if they're taken too far. And teaching and learning has the potential, um, even under the current system, to be um, a very fulfilling human exchange. Um, and universities are susceptible to public pressure, and we do have some ability to um, shape what the tertiary institutions offer to us. Um, as when uh, uh, Victoria University students campaigned for a long time and successfully won a drama school mm -hmm. at Victoria University. Um, so this is um, from, I think this is from 1960, um, salient reporting on campaigns from students and staff to get a drama school at Victoria University. Um, and that campaign was successful in 1970. Um, a theatre department was introduced, which is now under threat. Um, or also at Victoria University in 1980, when the first ever university, Marae, was opened on this campus, um, Te Heringa Waka. So you can see initially it was um, a repurposed building and then uh, a new marae was built, and I think uh, I think it's being refurbished now. A new marae again is being built, um, and one of our one of the people who fought for this was a fellow traveller of ours. So it was um, Tama Puata, who is a filmmaker, um, trade unionist, and socialist. Um, so despite the problems with university, um, we need to fight back. Um, we need to fight back because these cuts are not going to leave us better off. They're not going to leave the staff who lose their jobs better off. They're not going to leave the remaining staff better off who are going to be facing um, larger workloads and declining job security. Um, and it will leave us worse off as students as our options for study decrease and the quality of our education decreases as we lose um, these experienced, talented educators. Um, currently, we're seeing fewer people enrolling for university, and that's fair enough as a choice, but I think we have to ask in this context, is this really a choice? Um, so we're kind of locked in a downward spiral. So as the costs of studying increase, student enrollments drop, funding for universities drop, this is used to justify cuts, mm. studying becomes a less viable and attractive option, and so on and so forth. It's this downward spiral, whereas people should have the opportunity to pursue higher education if they want to. And there will be, you know, an immediate knock-on effect as well on the wider communities that these universities are part of if they go through. So Victoria University, you know, just thinking about the music and the theatre school that are both under attack, that has massive ramifications for Wellington. Um, and, you know, other university towns like Dunedin as well, um, there's going to be a profound sort of wider impact on the community if there are cuts to the tertiary system there. So we know that the extent to which universities can act as a um, critic and a conscience to society is limited, but underfunding and cutbacks are going to see it limited further. So not only will there be, you know, just fewer people researching, less research to contribute to public life, but the willingness of academics to rock the boat, to say things that are controversial, to challenge things, um, is going to decline with declining job security. And cuts are always used uh, they're always justified to say by saying this will save cuts down the line, and that has never been true. The opposite is always true. So every time cuts go through, it then gets easier to um, for further cuts to happen down the line. And um, conversely, successful fight back is a deterrent against cuts. So yeah, we have a um, and we have a proud history of student protest. Um, in New Zealand that we can uh, take inspiration from. So students aren't inherently radical, but we definitely have the capacity and the opportunity to be radical, you know, like we are encouraged to learn and to question. And although this is sort of changing, at least some of us are still free from the, you know, the burdens of work and raising children and things which sometimes come later in life and make it harder to organize political action. Um, so some, here is just some examples of um, student protest from the past. Um, and we're seeing um, 
uh, another kind of exciting round of student fight back happening now on New Zealand campuses too. Um, so the Protect Otago Action Group in Ōtipoti um, was formed against the cuts there, um, which sort of helped us to prepare really um, for when uh, Victoria University Students Against Cuts was launched at Vic, um, and both groups have been very active over the past few weeks and, and months. And um, it's early days yet, but Students Against Cuts groups are also forming at Massey, both at the Wellington and Manawatu campuses so far. Um, and there are new opportunities for solidarity between students and staff. So as the corporatization of universities has become more obvious, staff have been more likely to identify themselves as workers and to be willing to organize fight back through their unions. And um, student staff solidarity is much more a feature of the current wave of fight backs than it has been in previous years, um, especially at this campus where the TEU and um, the Student Association have been presenting a real sort of united front against the cuts. So students and staff can join together in joint action and can also fight back in different and complementary ways. So students have the capacity to be disruptive, to lead protests and occupations and generally make ourselves a nuisance for management, which isn't easy to ignore and to get publicity. And staff have the capacity for more sustained organization through their unions. Um, and of course, the capacity for um, industrial action, strike action. Um, so which is one of the most powerful weapons that we have in our arsenal. Um, of course, there are very few instances where it's legal to strike in New Zealand. And at this time, it doesn't seem that there's much appetite for illegal strikes within the tertiary education union, but that could always change. And I think it's worth, um, you know, as students reminding staff that this is an option and that if they were to take that path, they could count on the support of students in the wider community for that. And obviously, short of strike action, we should be supporting all of the um, the actions and initiatives that the, the union members make against the cuts. Um, so just to wrap up, I'll talk about the, um, the recent funding that has been announced. So this is sort of a win and a challenge. Um, so as I mentioned, for years, the TEU has been campaigning to get VCs to the table, push for more funding. And finally, this is happening at least at some universities to varying degrees. Um, and in response to our demands, the government has given an extra $128 million in funding to be spread over 2024 and 2025. Not a huge amount, especially uh, considering the numbers that we discussed earlier in the talk. They've also announced a review of the funding model um, which will take two years um, and the scope is to be decided at the end of 2023. Um, so this is a win and also presents us with some new challenges. The government is going to try to say, well, we've given you some more money, that's enough. The universities will try to say, oh, it's, this isn't enough money, we're just going to go ahead anyway. So we need to be still putting pressure on the vice chancellors um, to say that we still oppose these cuts. You should be using this new funding that you've been given to save as many jobs and programs as you can. Um, and working across universities is useful for this because um, at Vic, they've at least said they're going to reassess the situation now that they have more funding. Whereas at Otago, they claimed, oh, it doesn't come in until next year, so it's not relevant. So we can kind of say, well, hang on a minute. They're doing it at Vic. <laughs> um, and on the review of the funding model, um, this is this has opened up the question of what university funding and what university education should look like. Um, and I reckon that we should be we should be pushing this. We should be using this as a chance for us to talk about this issue and to raise our own demands. So the vice chancellors are talking about more cooperation between universities and utilizing digital technology and online teaching more and things like that. Um, so the question is not just what kinds of reforms are put through, but like how and to what end and in whose interest, like, are they going to mean improvements for staff and students, or are they going to mean just more exploitation, worse quality teaching and learning, so on and so forth. And so the direction that that goes on depends on us, um, depends on the pressure that we exert as staff and students and members of the wider community. So some of the demands that we could be talking about, that we could be raising in this period are um, free tertiary education. Like, why not? Um, remember when Labour introduced one free year 
of tertiary education saying they're going to keep unrolling another year and another year and then they just didn't yeah. um come on um a move away from the user pays model a move away from performance-based research funding and increased provision of student allowances or scrapping the student loan scheme altogether and introducing the universal education income which is what's being advocated by the New Zealand Union of uh, Students Associations. Yep. So that's, um, yeah, that's my introduction. And I'll just say on top of that, um, I think we should be proud of what we've achieved so far, both here in Wellington and other centres as well. Um, so we've put back a fight against the university management, against these cuts, and we've won concessions from the government. So they were very willing to just wash their hands of this whole situation at the beginning of this period. And now they've now shifted to having to acknowledge it, you know? Um, so we've made it into an issue that they can't ignore and we should keep doing that. 